Good evening, everyone. Um, good to be with you this evening. Um, um, we apologize for uh, not being able to do our in-person tonight, but um, we will resume in-person next Wednesday night. Uh, but um, it's good to be able to come to you uh, even by social media. Uh, so uh, we're still going to do the Bible study. We're going to be in the Revelation tonight. In Revelation chapter 7, we'll be dealing with verses 9 through 17. Uh, but uh, before we get started, we do want to take just a minute and uh, mention some of the uh, announcements. Uh, continue to support our Blessing Box. It's uh, really doing a, um, a good work in the community, uh, and we thank you for it. Um, continue to support CAM. Uh, that is a good work. It's always been a good work in Clayton uh, for a long time. Uh, and also, um, we have multiple different ways now that you can uh, uh, give to the church, uh, and we do appreciate your time, and we appreciate um, your faithful giving to the church. Uh, but uh, we do have many prayer requests, We uh, uh, many that are sick. Now, we do want to continue to remember all of those. Uh, that uh, stand in need of our prayers. I know uh, Brother Earl will start some treatments this week, so um, remember Brother Earl, um, Nancy's co-worker, Cindy and Lynn, um, uh, Miss Dar Stokes, uh, just and the list goes on. Uh, many that are sick right now. I know several that are, are sick with COVID. Uh, so we do want to remember each and every one of those at this time. But let's open up with a word of prayer and then we're going to dig into the Revelation chapter 7 and we're going to look at the uh, great multitude. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you for your many blessings, Lord. We do lift up all those that are sick and suffering, Lord. We do lift up uh, Brother H.B. Strickland's family this day, Lord. We do lift up, Lord, the Crowder family also and Lord, we lift up all of those that have lost loved ones um, in, in here recently. But Lord, we just uh, we reach out to you for those that are sick. We pray your blessings to be upon Brother Scott Westbrook. And we pray, Lord, that you would be uh, with um, that you would be with all of those that are standing in need at this time. Lord, many, many today need a touch from you. The lost, Lord, we pray for their hearts, their souls. We pray that they would get right with the Lord Jesus before it's everlasting too late. Lord, we just ask you to lead us, guide us, and direct us, be with our country, our leaders, and Lord, be with our church. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen. So turn in your Bibles this evening as we begin this study in the Revelation uh, chapter 7. Uh, verses 9 through 17. And um, uh, again, I want to uh, restate that this is still part of the vision. Uh, from chapter the beginning of chapter 4 uh, to the end of chapter 7 is still part of the vision that, that, that John is in. Jesus said to him, come up here and I'll show you these things which must be. And each one of these chapters pretty much, he's, it's reiterated that, um, uh, that this is uh, the things to come. And what we're seeing in chapter 7 is a break between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. And in this break... Jesus is showing John a foreshadow of things to come during the Great Tribulation. And so when we pick up our reading in uh, verse 9, it says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and, the, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, 
saying amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our, unto our God forever and ever, amen. And one of the elders answered and said unto him, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence come they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple and He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sunlight on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. May God bless the reading and expounding of His holy word. We see here in these verses of Scripture, uh, as, as verse 9 picks up, John says, I see a great multitude. I see a large, uh, of a multitude that is more than could be numbered. Most of the commentators put it in the millions, but... But he just said it's a, it's a large number of people and this is good news. This is good news because this is looking towards the, the end of the great tribulation. This are, these are the ones that have come out of great tribulation and it's a large number of people. So the question is posed and I posed it last week also. Who shall be saved during the awful tribulation coming upon the earth? The terrible tribulation is coming uh, in the end time, right before the end of the world, right before that battle of Armageddon that, that the Revelation records later on. There is great tribulation coming, but the good news is who, gonna, who is going to be saved? The important uh, question is this, is there any hope? Well, according to these verses of Scripture, yes. There is hope. There is a large number, a numberless multitude of believers that are saved. And as believers ourselves, we know this isn't the church because the church is already, we in verses 4 or in chapters 4 and 5, we've already seen the church in heaven. And, and the scripture says in verse 14 says that these are those that come out of great tribulation. So we know it's not the church. So we know it is people that accepted Christ during the great tribulation, during that time of, of horrific wrath from God. These are the ones that will join those in chapter 6 that were martyred and killed and put to death by the Antichrist. These are the same they will, these are the ones, these will be numbered with the ones that were martyred. They will be put to death uh, by, the, by the Antichrist. We noticed in verse 9 that, that he gives the origin of them. Uh, in verses 9 and 10, the glorious position of them. Verses 11 and 12, the glorious companions uh, in verses 13 and 14, their identity, the elder asked John for the multitude's identity. In verse 15, the function, what they do. And in verses 15 through 17, their blessings. So we see this and, and, and the rejoicing that we have in all of this is that there are those that will be saved. They are from all nations. Notice that that's what he says in verse 9. He says, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. They are of all nations. It, it, it means that they will be of every nation of the world that will be saved. Of all tribes. Of all people. 
Now you keep in mind that in the beginning of this chapter last week we talked about the 144,000 and yes, again, I want to emphasize that they are Jews. They are Jewish men that have been set apart and sealed by God to follow Jesus, to serve Jesus. So these will be the ones, the 144,000 will be the ones that will be ministering unto these that will be saved, that we're seeing right here. These are the ones. And they with these 144,000 will be preaching that, hey, look, the good news is, is that they can't be harmed, they can't be hurt because they have the name of God written in their forehead. They are children of God. And what we can rejoice in in these verses of Scripture, knowing that all nations, all kindred and people and tongues um, were saved, is the fact that it goes back to Noah's day. I, I, I looked at it uh, in my studies and... Uh, for over a hundred years, somewhere 140 years or so, Noah worked on the ark and he preached according to the scriptures. Uh, and when it come time for him to go into the ark, him and his family, eight of them went into the ark and God closed the door. But you see, the good news about what we're seeing right here in this look forward through the great tribulation is the fact that God doesn't shut the door this time. The church is gone. The church is in heaven. These are the ones that will be martyred and put to death during the great tribulation. Uh, and God has made a way for them to be saved. And as believers, as Christians, as those that are studying His Word, studying the Revelation right now, this is good news. This is ecstatically good news. In Romans chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, he's not going to close the door during the great tribulation. He's going to still seek and seek to save those which will believe. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Who, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? He, he wants us to come. He still wants people to come. And the 144,000 are going to be ministering and following Christ and working and serving Christ in this world during the Great Tribulation. Again, I keep going back to the fact that the church is not going to be here. We have our opportunity right now to serve God, follow Christ, and lead the lost to Him. It's our time. It's, it's the church's time. It's the believer's time right now to do just that. But notice what it says, that they stood before the throne. They stand before the throne of God and before the Lamb. They want to be near Him. They want to be there with Him. And the detail that, that, that Jesus gives, the detail that is given to John and what John is seeing is so magnificent as the fact that he can see them. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They were near to Christ. They were face to face with God in Christ. I can't, you know, I can't imagine, but I can't wait either to, to that day that I can see the one who died for me. And you can say amen to that. They're honored to be in His presence. To know God and Christ in all their fullness and being. To know and see the Father. They were before the throne. They stood before Him. They were clothed in white robes. They were clothed in white. That clothed in white, if you go back into um, chapter 6, even the ones that were put to death that they saw under the altar, they were clothed in white. They were, they were, 
They were robed in white array. Why is that? Because they died for the name of Christ and they were purified because of their faith. The white robes are signs of righteousness through Christ. It's a sign of being made free from the defilement and smut of sin through Christ. The sin, a, a sign of the victory over sin, death, and judgment through Christ. A sign of being perfected forever through Christ. A sign of being a heavenly creature of having the glorious privilege of living forever in the presence of God through Christ. That's what it means when you see them arrayed in white is that they've been purified, they've been cleansed, and they are righteous through Christ. They hold palm branches in their hands, he says. The the the. The psalm, the palms are symbols of celebration, triumph, uh, victory, deliverance, and joy. If you remember, if you go back into the Gospels and the entry of Christ at the Passover, the, what we refer to as Passion Week, if you go back and you look at that, as, they, as He was entering in and riding the colt, they were laying down palms and their garments before Him and singing Hosanna, crying Hosanna. The palm was a sign of celebration, of triumph, of victory, deliverance, and joy. And this is the same thing that we're seeing here. They had palms in their hand. They were celebrating. They were celebrating their victory in Christ. They were celebrating their deliverance in Christ. They were celebrating their joy in Christ. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God. They shouted praises of salvation. They were shouting praises of salvation unto Him. They praised Him for salvation. Brothers and sisters, we should be doing that now. We should be doing that publicly now. Is, is praising God for our salvation publicly. For what the Lord has set free is free indeed. I don't know about you, but I count myself free. I count myself blessed. He delivered them through the great trials of the great tribulation. He delivered them by giving them power to believe and endure to the end. They're praising Him. They're praising Him. They're praising Him because He has accepted them. Because He has given them a glorious privilege of presence, of His presence. Notice that they're praising God and the Lamb. There is a companion, uh, uh, there are companions to the numberless multitude. We see in verse 11, verses 11 and 12, and all the angels stood around about the throne. The outer circle around the throne was the multitudes of angels that John has seen. The scriptures have already in his vision in in the previous chapters, we've already seen this large multitude of angels. But they stand around about the throne. And, a, and, a, and, and notice what it says now, that they stood around about the throne and about the elders. So next would uh, come the 24 elders and about the elders and the four beasts, and then inside the four beasts, uh, inside of the four beasts, and they're, they're, they're positioned at the corners of the throne. And then they fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped. They worshipped. 
they praised Him. And verse 12 says, they, they, they worshipped Him saying, Amen. Let it be. Make it so. They praise God for His blessings. Every good and perfect gift comes from God, brothers and sisters. Every perfect gift, every good and perfect gift comes from God. They praised Him for the blessings. They praised Him for His glory. He is a glorious God. His glory abounds. His glory has been in this world since Genesis 1. From the moment that God said, let there be light, the glory of God has been in the world. The glory of God is in the world today. Jesus said, said that He was the light of the world, but then as He went to heaven, He says to us now, you are the light of the world. So the light and the glory of God is still in the world today through the Spirit of God, through wisdom. He's omniscient. They praise God for His wisdom, for His supreme majesty and intelligence. He is all-knowing. From in the beginning, God, He knew what it was all going to be. Every moment of every day works in God's plan. He knew what today would hold. He knows what tomorrow holds. He knows when the final amen is. But they praised Him for His wisdom. Notice what else. They praised Him for thanksgiving. They offered up thanksgiving to God. They thanked Him for creation, life, salvation, redemption, for everything they thanked Him. You see, we are to pray without ceasing. We are to always be thankful and giving thanks. You see, God is one of these gods that, that when the more we thank Him and are appreciative for what He's done for us, the more He does. The more He does. They praised God. They praised God for His, uh, for His honor. God is, is, God is faithful and true. He's faithful and true. He honors every word that He says. He stands by every promise that He's promised. They say, the Scripture teaches us that He is a promise maker and a promise keeper. They praise God for His power. He is, he is the creator of the universe. He spoke into existence all of creation. He spoke all of it into existence. He is all powerful. He holds the world in the palm of His hand. They praise God for His mighty, His might and His strength. You see, God's strength is our strength. They praised Him for His power, His strength, His might. His strength is our strength. He is our sustainer. He is the one that sustains us and gives us the ability to each and every day move forward and go on. Put one foot in front of the other. It is His strength and His might. When we are weak, He is strong. They praised uh, the praise of heavenly beings is an example for us. What they were doing around the throne is important because this is what we should be doing now. We should be thanking Him and praising Him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, it says, for, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in uh, in your spirit, which are God's. You see, we're to praise Him all the time. 
in verses 13 and 14. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these? What are these that are arrayed in white robes? And whence come they? Where did they come from? And, and he says, and, and so John's response to him, Sir, you know who they are. You know who they are. It is then that the elder tells John what he is witnessing, what he is seeing. He says, remember, remember this, this scene has not yet happened is what my commentator said. Remember that this is a vision. This is a, a, a look forward through the great tribulation. These are things that have not taken place yet. And so we remember that it has not happened and God has given John a vision that, uh, of the things that are to happen in the future. The day is coming when the numberless multitude, apparently millions, will stand before God having just entered heaven. He says, Sir, you know who, who they are. And he says to me, These are they which come out of great tribulation. These are the ones that have come out of the great tribulation. There again, the good news is, is that even during the pouring out of God's wrath on all of creation, of all of sin, of all of this world, even during the pouring out of God's wrath, there are still going to be people saved. There are still going to be those that will receive Christ and accept Him as their Lord and Savior and go to heaven. A large multitude of all nations, kindreds, peoples, tongues. And that's the good news. This is, as he looks forward, this is those that have come out of great tribulation. Daniel uh, predicted this terrible time of trouble. He saw it in a vision himself. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. Jesus foretold of the great tribulation uh, that the great tribulation was coming upon the earth in Matthew 24. As Pastor Will said when he was teaching earlier uh, in the month um, on the opening of the seals, uh, chapter 6 in the beginning, chapter 6 of the Revelation runs along beside and in conjunction with what Jesus was saying in Matthew 24. Paul also describes the attacks of the Antichrist against Christians uh, of all religions in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. John says that the Antichrist will, uh, will actually make war against the saints, the believers of God. And that is found in later chapters in the Revelation chapter 13. He sees it. And notice what else. Not only is, are these that came out of the great tribulation, and that, but they have washed their robes. They are those who have washed their robes white. How? Well, John is told. He, they are washed, they wash their robes white with the blood of the Lamb. The same way that me and you were cleansed. The same way that our, our lives were, were changed. The same way that we were washed white as snow. That our hearts were cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. White stands for purity and perfection. They washed. In other words, when it says that uh, they come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes, how did they wash their robes? They washed their robes by accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. The same way that our hearts are washed in the blood, we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. 
and we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. In verse 15, Therefore are they before the throne of God. Notice what they're doing. They're serving Him. They're serving Him day and night in His temple. They're serving Him day and night. Now, I want you to understand, okay? I want you to know that 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 there is no day and night in heaven. That's, it, that's figurative. In other words, they are, they are serving Him continually, constantly. It was written in a manner that we would understand. Because time doesn't matter in, in heaven. Once you enter into eternity, time don't make no difference anymore. Once you enter into the presence of God's kingdom, His heavenly kingdom... There is no clocks. There are no there there is no time anymore. There is no day or night. There is no sunset or no sunrise. So he wanted us to understand that that these were they that they these these that were seen that have washed their robes and that have accepted Christ and been washed in the blood of the Lamb, they were serving God. They were serving their heavenly Father continually in His temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. (laughs) They have an ever-living presence with God forevermore. In other words, there will be no separation from Him. They will ever be in His presence. He will dwell with them. He will be their God. He is today dwelling in heaven with all the saints that are gathered. They're gathered around the throne today. They're serving Him today. He is their God and He's dwelling with them. And He'll be with them forevermore. They will have the living presence of God with them forever. They will have all their physical needs met. Notice that in verse 16, he says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. In other words, he's going he's to take care of them. He's going to provide everything. But then again, that's what he does for us now. If we trust Him, if we believe in Him, if we trust in God and put all our hope, our faith in Him, He meets every need that we have. We don't miss anything if we are His child. He meets our needs now. But when we get to heaven, hmm, there will be no worries or concerns at all. These are those that made it through. These are those that, that, that were, were martyred or put to death during the great tribulation that he's seeing. And when they get into heaven, into God's presence, he will meet every need that they have, that they have and that anything that they would need. Neither shall the sun set on them, nor the heat. In other words, He will be their protector. They will have no worries, no cares, no concerns. You see, we could live that way now. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because we know who holds tomorrow. We don't have to worry about the things to come. We don't have to worry about anything because we know who holds everything. We know who our protector is. The psalmist says that He's our shield and our buckler. He is our high tower. He is our protector. The sunlight will not be on them, nor the heat. They will will not feel the effects of any kind of pressure. You see, we live a life this day and time where we're, we're under all kinds of stress and pressures. 
But when we get to heaven, there'll be no stress or pressures. There'll be no, uh, there'll be no anxiousness. There'll be no animosity. There'll be no stress. Huh, that would be nice. They will have their spiritual needs met. Verse 17 goes on to tell us, For the Lamb, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. He'll meet their spiritual needs. Because that word feed means to shepherd. The Lamb Himself shall shepherd. The word shepherd means to feed, to look after, to pasture, to take to pasture. In other words, to meet the need. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them. Of course, Jesus said that He would be their shepherd. He is their guidance. Notice that he says, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. They will have the leadership and direction of the Lord Jesus Christ to guide them. We will serve him. We will work. We will serve God. We will serve Christ. The, the scriptures tell us in the revelation that we will, or the scriptures tell us that we will rule and reign with him during the millennial reign. We're going to serve him in so many different ways. The Lamb of God himself will give us direction and guidance. He shall lead them unto fountains living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. They will, they, they will have all sorrow wiped away from their eyes. There'll be no more pain, sorrow, or suffering as we find later is said in the Revelation. There will be no more tears in heaven there will be no crying. There will be, there will be no separation. There'll be no pain. There'll be, we will be absent of all the things that burden us in this world. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more temptation of Satan. This is a great multitude. This is good news. Even for those that will have to endure the great tribulation. Again, I, I tell you that, that, that we as the believers now, we need to be busy about the Father's business. We need to be telling people because it is important that when that trumpet sounds that we're out of here. That we're as the saints, as the church, that we are in heaven. Because the great tribulation is not going to be, it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be Another day in this world, this that we're in right now is not the great tribulation. Don't care what any theologian says, this is not it yet. During the great tribulation, the wrath of God will be poured out on all the world, not just parts of it, on all the world. Just like in Noah's day, the flood was a global flood. It wasn't localized. It was a global flood. It was complete and utter devastation and destruction. They will have all sorrow wiped away from their eyes. And I want you to notice in that verse of Scripture, and I want you to, you can say amen to it, okay? God, God Himself, God Himself, brothers and sisters, shall wipe away all. How many? All. All means what? All. All the time. All tears from their eyes. In other words, in the presence of God, there is no sorrow. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. In John 4, verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. In other words, once we enter into the kingdom of God, we will not suffer anymore. We will not struggle anymore. John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He shall, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You'll never have another need. These were the ones that, that were, that came out of the great tribulation. This is a, again, I want to, I want you to understand that this is still, this is a part of the vision that started in chapter 4 and has run through and will run through chapter 8. It is part of the vision that John was seeing. These are the things that must happen. The four horsemen of the apocalypse in the beginning of chapter 6, uh, as he opened the seals, he loosened the tools that would be used to pour out the wrath of God on the world. This is good news. This is just a break. As again, I say, it's a break between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. Next week, we open up into the seventh seal and then we move in to what is to come next. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the lesson, Lord. We thank you for, for Lord, speaking to our hearts. Lord, I pray that as we uh, have entered into this, this, this study, Lord, we pray for your leadership, your guidance. We pray your blessings to be upon each and every word. Lord, may we grow closer to you. And Lord, may we learn more and more about your holy word. And Lord, we pray for your continued leadership and guidance. We pray, Lord, that you would walk with us the remainder of this week. And Lord, that you and you alone would be magnified and glorified in our lives. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for being able to come into people's homes this evening. To come into their homes and to share the Word of God. May God bless the reading and expounding. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. We look to see you again next Wednesday night. Look, if you don't have a church home, come join us Sunday morning. We'd love to have you join us in service. We understand if you're not comfortable, but we'd still love to have you come join us. Bring your mask and come sit down and we'll open up the bread of life. We look to see you Sunday morning and next Wednesday night in person. May God bless you and we'll see you soon.